hours times 45 years times the minutes, and I figured it would take me 23,652,000 minutes to give my speech tonight. <laughs> but I gotta do it in 45 minutes. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to go out and talk to a lot of school groups at all levels, college, high school, grade schools, particularly in the Boulder, Denver area. And when I go into the fourth grade classes, which often have three classes combined, at the end of my talks, I bring in a sample of ore from the Caribbean or cross mine, and I give each student a sample, it's a small sample, perhaps this size. And I'm demobbing all my equipment, going back to my truck at lunchtime, and a little third grader comes up to me and he goes, uh, Mr. Miner, <laughs> Mr. Miner, can you tell me how much this gold ore sample is worth? And I'll say, well, let's figure it out. So I took out a balance and we weighed it, it weighed a quarter of a pound. And I said, there's a half an ounce of gold per ton in that sample and eight ounces of silver per ton. And you've just got a quarter of a pound here. Today, gold prices are 1,200, silver's at 18. I said, that sample's worth a penny. And he goes, chucks, I just paid that fourth grader a buck for that sample. <laughs> And that's how I, I thought, that's sort of what the gold industry is like sometimes. Um, I hope tonight that in this short time, I can tell you some things that I've learned the hard way. Uh, I started out mining uh, in high school in Colorado Springs for Golden Cycle. My first job was at the Ajax mine, and we were keeping that 3,100 foot shaft open, the hoist running, and the Carlton Tunnel draining water out of the Cripple Creek District. The Ajax mine went back into use a little bit in 1977 through 83, and it has not been affected by the pit mining down there yet. Uh, but Cripple Creek was the first district. My dad operated Colorado Lime Company, so at age 11 I was working up the quarry above Colorado Springs, a scar on the mountain. and. Uh, at age 14, I was running the crushing plant and helping with drilling and blasting. And we could see the Colorado Division of Mines coming up in their white trucks, and the guys would grab me and hide me <laughs> while the Division of Mines director was there. But uh, my father operated limestone mines in Colorado Springs uh, up until 1980. Um, when I went to Boulder to school, I worked in six different mines. One of them was the Andesite Rock Quarry, just west of Lyons. And it kept me out of the Vietnam War, actually, because we were making uh, andesite high-quality rock for the Burlington Northern Railroad. And at that time, the, uh, the military had a lottery system. And I was working and trying to go through geology school at CU, and I got behind one semester. So I went from 2S to 1A, and they called me in for the draft, and I looked at this sergeant and I said, sir, I feel like I'm doing more for my country mining and the site rock for the railroad than going and fighting people I don't know. And he said, well, I'm gonna, and a month later, the lottery happened and I got number 250 or something, so I didn't have to go to <coughs> But right after that, I uh, worked in an underground tungsten mine outside of Ward, Colorado, where we were following a shelight vein that was about this wide and we drove a 300 foot tunnel on it. So I would drill this side and shoot it, muck the waste out and then slab the shoe off. And the way we identified that was with a fluorescent light. And uh, that lasted until I went to Caribou in 1971. Uh, I started out Caribou with a pick and shovel operation. My first partner was Columbine Glass Company, which makes all the bottles for Coors Beer at the time and Jack LaFollette had had Union Supply Company and knew the Caribou Mine well by supplying them with mine supplies in the 1950s. So uh, we became partners and I had full reign at Columbine Glass Company. They had a beautiful machine shop and I got to take all their scrap steel. In fact, the head frame that I built underground the cross mine all came from scrap steel from Columbine Glass Company. Jack was involved with the Henrietta Mine over in Silverton and the, and the Howardsville Mill, and he put about $6 million into that project. And there was a breccia pipe supposedly coming down at the Henrietta Mine, 
And rather than drill a few inexpensive core holes in to hit this, he had an Atlas, Atlas Copco mini facer machine that cost millions of dollars to pull up there. And it was only uh, a, a meter and a half in diameter. And he was gonna bore this hole in and hit this supposed rich silver pipe. <coughs> the machine got stuck. It was a multi-million dollar failure. And Jack just, we just decided to buy him out. The problem for me over the years is I had a 15% NSR royalty on the cross mine. And though we were, I reopened the mine, put in production, uh, the owners would not sell us a royalty. And everywhere I went, whether it was majors or juniors or international finding people, they would not put the money up to develop the mine properly until we got rid of the royalty. So we finally shut the production off in 1986, went to Portland. <laughs> That's right, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> oh, and I forgot, of course, some of you met my wife, Sarah, and our little baby. Uh, the little miner there was born at our house right below the mine 18 months ago. And I lug him up to the mine all the time uh, uh, in a little baby wrap thing. And uh, he does water quality work with me and he's ridden in our loader. And, uh, so he's getting a very early beginning at the mines. But, uh, he's got a good future too, Tom. Yeah. The uh, next partner uh, tried to, was a wonderful partner, Ken Good. He owned the Denver Tech Center. And I had 55 people working for me in 1980. Um, and we were running the Boulder Mill around the clock and we were reopening the Caribou Mine. And then he made a run on Costco, the oil shale company, and Exxon was going to do the colony oil shale project, and he bought their stock at $37 a share. He bought another $40 million of it on margin, and we all woke up one day and said Exxon pulls out a colony oil shale project, and the stock went to $5, and he was bankrupt. So I had to lay off a lot of my employees. We bought him out. Uh, then I got involved with an Australian company, and uh, we started core drilling, and they were heavily involved in a lead zinc mine in New Brunswick, Canada, called the Caribou of all things. And uh, Larry Barrett came into the picture with us. He was with Kennecott Anaconda. Uh, he worked for me for four years as our head geologist. We started core drilling both at the cross mine and around the district. Um, the Australians uh, took down a $45 million loan from Westpac Bank on the caribou lead zinc mine in New Brunswick and they failed on it, the whole project failed and they had to leave and so we bought them out. All of my partners except for one left the project because they failed on something else. But meanwhile, every time we did something, we kept acquiring more property, consolidating the district, adding more to the mine, being in production, core drilling, building this district uh, to where today we have 550 acres of patented ground, uh, just under 2,000 acres of unpatented ground. We have three modern surface plants. We've done thousands of feet of underground mine development and 176,000 feet of drilling. Uh, one thing we're finding at Caribou and working with some of the top geologists like Larry Barrett and then Bob Acker, I noticed on common ground that the uh, uh, homestake property the McLaughlin mine was featured in that movie. He was the senior geologist at the McLaughlin mine. Then he went on with Newmont to work with Carlin. He worked for us for nine years and did some impeccable work on the geology of Caribou. Another thing that we've utilized heavily is uh, the Balkan Map Tech program right down here on Union. Uh, Map Tech has been a huge asset for us. We've dumped all the mine workings, the aerial contour surveys, the uh, aerodab work, geophysical work, all of the core drilling, all of the uh, faults, the structures, everything into that program. So we can go down there and say, it takes about an hour to start really beaming everything up. But when you do that, you start seeing a picture of caribou that's awfully exciting. I often walk out of there feeling like I'm not touching the ground and we haven't even scratched the surface yet. Now, why is this deposit so interesting? It's a mesothermal deposit. It's a low to medium temperature. 
Uh, it has all the characteristics of districts like the Coeur d'Alene's in Idaho. The Lucky Friday mine is a good example of that. And the deeper we drill, the, interesting, the more interesting the mineralogy gets. We've drilled some holes down 2,700 feet now. The one thing that's changing is we're seeing a lessening of the silver and the increasing of the gold. Uh, structurally, what makes this district interesting is that we have these strike slip faults that are northeast, southwest, and they're great big faults that run for well over 10,000 feet in strike length. There's dilations in these faults, and in between the strike slip faults are another number of ladder veins. So when I first started at the cross mine in 1971, we had two principal veins that cross the crown point, and they had just touched the rare metals vein in 1939 before the War Closure Act. Today we've identified 106 veins, stockworks, uh, breccia pipe, uh, and we're finding out by drilling that these zones go for thousands of feet on strike, and we have seen no let up in depth on these <laughs> veins. The cross mine is 200 feet deep below our working level. The caribou mine is 1,200 feet deep. The caribou mine produced 20 million ounces of silver, and we don't know how much gold. We assume about 300,000 ounces in history. Um, what's intriguing about it is that in, in the 19, late 1940s, the Atomic Energy Commission was uh, scanning the Front Range of Colorado looking for pitch blend. And on the caribou dump, they found a trace of pitch blend mixed in with some very high uh, Galena silver ore. And the Atomic Energy Commission came in and funded driving the Idaho Tunnel, which is right next to the cross mine, in 4,000 feet and hitting the old caribou shaft at the 500 level. They dewatered down to the 1040 level, and Don Nelson, who was executive president of Sears and Roebuck, was also head of the war board for the United States government during World War II. And so they started core drilling. And they were hitting a bunch of new silver veins, but they did find one shoot of pitch blend that was so exciting that uh, Look Magazine published a front page article that the United States has found a source for this atomic uh, bomb program. Well, it turned out to be nothing. There was a total of seven tons of pitch blend ore mine, but the silver grades in that pitch blend were running in the thousands of ounces per ton. Well, the, those caribou people decided to sell the mine to an industrialist from New York City, George Horvath, and he deepened the shaft from the 1040 down to the 1230 and opened up the no-name vein, and they named the new veins after Don Nelson. So you have the East Nelson Intermediate and West Nelson, and they opened up some fabulous like rich ore on the 1230 foot level. In the center of the no-name vein on the 1230 is a seam of ruby silver, and Mr. Horvath in New York caught wind that they were high grading and stealing ore from him, and he ordered the pump shut off in 1956. I met him in 1971. I made 14 trips to New York City to negotiate a deal on the Caribou, and we bought it, lost it three times, and it wasn't until his death and his secretaries of many long years inherited it that we bought the Caribou mine from him in 1997. An interesting story about Mr. Horvath, and I could talk for hours about him. One of my first visits, we were having dinner in the Oak Room at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. I was 25 years old, and I noticed that he had a bone-handled pistol in his suit. And I said, uh, George, why are you carrying a gun? And he pulled out a badge, and he said, I've been deputized in Dade County, Florida, and I have a license to carry this gun. And I said, well, why are you carrying it? And he said, well, I don't know if you noticed, but I have a bulletproof limousine that brings me to work every day. The windows on my office on West 57th Street are bulletproof. I have multiple locks. I said, why? He said, well, in 1967, I borrowed $28 million from the Teamsters Union Pension Fund to buy the Tropicana Hotel in Las Vegas. And I defaulted on the whole $28 million. And Jimmy Hoffa, and the Teamsters Union turned against me. Then I turned against them and became, I, I informed the federal government, the FBI, about their activities. And so they put a marker on my head. And I said, well, whatever happened to Jimmy Hoffa? And he said, I was very much a part of 
making sure that he had a concrete block with chains around it, and we dumped him in Lake Michigan. And I never knew if that was true, and I've always wanted to follow up on that, Tom, but that was true? in 1974. Um, throughout this career of building at Caribou, it's, I've had year after year things happen to me like that. It's been phenomenal. But most important is uh, sticking with this district, still working seven days a week on it, and having incredible highs and lows, whether it's dealing with severe weather, uh, partnerships, financing, uh, or the great times when we were in production and producing gold and silver ore. We actually operated the Belmont Mill in Boulder, which was the old Allied Chemical Mill, and we ran it from 1976 until 1990. We tried to buy that mill multiple times, but the owner wouldn't sell to us, but it was a fabulous mill for milling the caribou ores, and it, we would mill 25 tons of ore to make a ton of concentrate. And we ship most of our concentrates to Cominco up at Trail BC and to uh, Osarco down in El Paso and East Helena. Um, I've got a few pictures to show you. Hopefully they're not all upside down. showing up at Caribou now. Well, I came up to do water quality work one Sunday last fall, and this big bull moose was in our water pond. My dog went over and put his nose up to the moose. I got a picture, and all of a sudden that bull moose leaped that fence and came after the dog and after me, and we ran in the building, and I kept peeking out, so I grabbed the dog and we jumped in the truck, and the bull moose came right at the truck like that. And uh, we've had a couple of pretty interesting moose encounters. In the early days of Caribou, the uh, <coughs> district was found by Sam Conger in 1864. It took him until 1869 to learn what he had discovered. And pretty soon thereafter, there was a big silver rush. Um, this is typical of the hoist, the steam hoist that they had at the Caribou mine. What's interesting about this is the cable for that hoist is the, is the boat cable. Uh, that's, these are a little bit out of order, but during our production years, we loaded the ore in uh, tandem dump trucks and shipped it down to Boulder. That's a picture of the cross line, actually what it looks like today, and us core drilling in the lower picture. Uh, we've done uh, 176,000 feet of core drilling. That was a long year 44 drill that we used, but I can tell you from experience that we found that having top drill contractors in, was far cheaper than drilling ourselves, particularly with the long year unit, because when we needed a part for that, they had to manufacture it. They didn't have it on the shelf. And uh, that was a conventional core drill. However, we were able to drill, drill some very deep holes with that particular unit. Uh, here's Murray Watts drilling. Murray Watts is a graduate of the Colorado School of Mines and a very well-renowned core driller, and he's done a, an awful lot of drilling for us over the M. Shaw, in a minute we're going to look at and address the M. Shaw issues, but that's one of our many maps that we have to post on the surface and underground for ventilation and escape at the cross line. This is uh, perhaps the best drilling company I ever had at Caribou. It's Idea Drilling out of Hibbing, Minnesota. That was a QS1000 electric or a hydraulic drill, and they never had one breakdown in the entire drilling program for us. It was a very quiet rig, they got excellent recovery, and uh, that's down in the uh, Caribou uh, bog area. Um, this is looking down at the bog area, about 1,800 feet from Caribou Hill, and the no-name man is dipping into the bog, striking like this, and we drilled five holes in the no-name man, and 104 and 97 
we hit the no name bay and at 1,341 feet down perpendicular and went out of it at 1,401 feet. And it was 60 feet wide and some of the most beautiful mineralization that I've ever seen at Caribou. That's 1,800 feet away from where it was last mined. Uh, traditionally, we dumped the ore, and in the winter months, we had to load it in the dump trucks and get it down to the mill because it would freeze very rapidly. We're working with Harrison Western Corporation right now over on Quail Street. This was a proposed shaft we were going to do in 1988. Our deepest level is the fourth level, and we're proposing the St. Canuber Eagle shaft at the cross mine. Uh, develop not only the existing veins form that we have here, but the new Apache system and this Anaconda system that's striking northeast, southwest, and dipping into the cross mine. Uh, what we're seeing is a big trunk zone here, and every 100 feet we go down here, when we build our new 200 ton a day mill, every 100 feet we go below the fourth level and keeps that mill running for two years. And I would hope that we would see that go down eventually uh, eight or 9,000 feet. It won't be in my lifetime. But this was the first mine I worked at in Victor, Colorado. It's the AKX mine. And that's a modern head frame. It might be what you'll see at the cross mine even as early as this year, we're hoping. Modern hoys, um, different than the rope hoys. I was at the SME convention in Denver and met with Lake Shore and Hepburn. And you can see what Emshaw is requiring now for hydraulic brakes on the hoist and all the bells and whistles. But this is a single drum hoist that uh, if you're hoisting ore every day, you have to have something that's safe, efficient, and engineered to today's uh, technology. One of the reasons that I've had trouble hearing is I've drilled about 85,000 holes with the jack leg drill. They run at 120 decibels in a quiet area. In the early days, we didn't have the hearing protection we have today. The new mine that we have, I envision, will have electric hydraulic drill jumbles um, that are very quiet. You can actually pop a disc in there and you can pre-program your hole pattern. And the reason for this is they make these very tiny, as you guys know, or big ones. But for narrow bay mining, one person can bring this over and drill a heading in under an hour, pull over and drill another heading, another heading, another heading. Where a jack leg drill, you're drilling for two or three hours. Um, and this increases your efficiency uh, incredibly. Um, when you guys come up to the mine, we're gonna do a little bit of safety thing, but we're gonna go in the uh, <coughs> portal here Look at the underground hoist room, the original 1870 cross vein, crown point, escape way, Juliet Stockwork. And then we're gonna go out and look at the four brand new veins that we've opened up called the Apache system. Somebody said, Tom, what's the greatest thrill you have mining? It's right here, because this is the Apache vein. You can see the mineralization. It's when you go in and drill around, and in this case it was 26 holes, and you load it, you, well you demold your hoses, your drill. In fact, a few years ago I drove a 150 foot tunnel at age 65 with a jack leg, and I got really upset because my young miners would come by and start rolling up my hoses, and they said, we'll carry your drill for you. I said, if you don't carry that drill, I'm gonna fire you, because that's the thrill of mining is setting up your equipment, drilling around, demobbing your equipment, loading your powder, hooking in your non-electrics, and lighting your fuse and walk out about 600 feet and you <laughs> You ventilate and you come back an hour later with a hose and a scaling bar. And I'll tell you from experience that gold veins anywhere, but particularly here, Say you cut a channel sample here and don't even look at what you're sampling and send it off to ALS Chemex. That's who we use as an assay firm. All right, you're gonna get a value of gold, silver, let's say copper, or however you wanna sample it. But I can assure you that you go in one inch path where you just sampled, it can be very different. And when you core drill, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, you're drilling, we drill most of our holes in Q diameter, just under two inches. 
and you hit a major vein, or you hit a vein you know about, or you're doing infill drilling, you get a two inch sample back. So you get 10 feet that runs half ounce in that two inches. You're talking about a vein that goes down thousands of feet and strikes for thousands of feet. Could be five feet wide or 50 feet wide. What does it run two inches over from this? Or a foot over? And that's part of the magic of gold mining. Um, we hit down in the peat bog in an area that nobody's ever prospected or whatever. We hit a calcite breccia pipe that's 55 feet wide. It's pure white calcite. And in that, we had one foot that ran six ounces of gold per ton, 1,100 feet below the surface. We had one interval in there that ran 800 ounces of silver per ton. That's pretty darn exciting. That's what the core looks like right here. But what's a foot away from that? Or 100 feet above it, or 200 feet below it? And, and that's what makes this precious metal mining so exciting. But that, for me, is one of my greatest excitements is drilling around, shooting it, Coming back in and seeing what the heck the mud pile looks like. Pretty darn exciting. Uh, that's when I first started the cross mine with the Nonco 12B mucker and a little three quarter ton car. Actually, that's the car that Cadre helped me push uh, muck web. So there's the early days in the early 70s. Uh, I had a little Sears building and a building to cover our air compressor, and that's what the cross mine looks like. Rich asked me, he said, Tom, is there a better way to put a shaft down than sinking conventionally? <laughs> I said, yeah, there is, because the technology's there. You guys are aware of this. This is a blind shaft bore from the surface down. And what happens if you cut a shaft in hard rock like we have with one of those, the integrity of the rock's better, it's clean, you can hang your steel sets. And the thing is, is that in this one, as it's cutting, it's putting the three quarter inch cuttings inside this, and they're coming back up in the stream of water. But there is something to that, and uh, I threw that in for Rich. That's typical of the rounds that we drill in the mud. Uh, the key to these rounds is drilling a burn hole with a large diameter center hole, you don't shoot it. Hitting these with instantaneous zeros, ones, twos, threes, fours, and then around. And then drilling these down on an angle so that you're shooting your muck back on your rail or whatever you're, you're mucking from. That's a very typical round that we would drill. That was two weeks ago at the cross mine. Um, dealing with wicked weather with old equipment is just another challenge for me. Um, water quality, uh, the way we meet our NPDES uh, permit and with the state of Colorado, which is one of the toughest permits we have is seven days a week putting lime in our ponds even though our water is very alkaline and raising the pH up to just below nine and then we have a secondary big settlement pond um, that um, oh and by the way to operate the water discharge system in Colorado now you have to be licensed uh, we're a class B operation so you have to be licensed by the uh, state of Colorado, which means you have to take a test every five years and pass it uh, to get a license to operate the system that you actually build. One of the many things we do, apart from bi-monthly grab samples that we bring over to the SPS labs over here in Wheat Ridge, is the whole toxicity testing. So every quarter, and I'll do that again at the end of this month, we have to take two one-gallon samples of our effluent take them into Seacrest Labs in Louisville, and they put flathead minnows and invertebrate water fleas in our water, and they have to live so many hours. You do that on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and if you have a mortality rate that exceeds what the state allows, then you have to go to further testing, and you have to identify the toxin. So we do this every quarter. It costs $1,650 for the samples to run from my time, but it's, and then the reporting, uh, oh, by the way, Dan, there's your, Dan was involved with this program for 17 years, 
And we figured the school teachers <coughs> took part in the three weeks of classes here at the School of Mines, and then they, Dan took them around all over the state to visit coal mines, aggregate mines, metal mines, all kinds of things. We figured the time that they go back to their classroom and educate their students, that mining's not all this bad. That it, we just learned an awful lot. It was a fabulous program. That's a few years ago when they were the cross mine as the uh, explosives magazine. Um, one thing about explosives, nowadays I used to buy explosives from Emerson Hill in downtown Denver in the 70s. I would load up a ton and a half of dynamite in the back of my pickup, 3,000 blasting caps, fused dead cord, and I'd drive to Boulder and I'd go have dinner. I had a car <laughs> over there. I didn't have a license. I didn't have to have a license to buy explosives. Um, today, after 9-11, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms has taken over the explosives. And I can tell you, it is tough. When you get a license to buy explosives, you have 10 fingerprints. They check everything about your background. You can't have any convictions for anything. You can't have this or that. It takes some time to get it. But when you order dynamite, it has to be delivered by the distributor in a special truck, and they make you sign six pages, single space of paper. It says you will not do this, you do this. But the toughest part is inventory. The alcohol, tobacco, and firearms comes up every year, whether we're active or not. And say right now we have 10 cases of powder, we have 6,000 blasting caps, and 3,000 feet of fuse, and 400 feet of dead cord, and all this. And those agents come up with their guns and their badges and they look at our inventory from the previous year and they sit there for hours and count every blasting cap, every stick of powder, and I'll tell you if one of them is missing, you're in big trouble. So we're getting ready to do that next week for our annual inspection. But anyway, that's a little bit of dance program there. That was a wonderful, wonderful program. Uh, Property positions, when we do a financing, we have to be able to go to the financial people and say this is our property position. You can see here that almost all these claims we've had the corners resurveyed, whether they're patented or unpatented. Uh, you can see the cross mine, the Idaho tunnel that goes in 4,000 feet, the caravan workings, and you can see the overlay of our claims. Land position is uh, terribly important. Equipment, whether it's used or new, I've been looking at some mining equipment up in uh, Quebec, Canada. One thing at the Cross Mine that's fascinating is that we have only mined from here up, <coughs> and as these veins go down, they form a big trunk zone. And some of these veins never made it up past about 400 feet below the fourth level. But we're learning all this by core drawing. Uh, Rich said, Tom, you need a front-end loader. We'll put up a little bit of money, but we don't have enough to buy a new one with, but go to Richie Brothers Auction in Denver in December. And I went there and found a loader for the exact amount of budget that Rich allowed. And by golly, it turned out to be a wonderful machine. It's 1999 vintage, but I love it. It runs perfect. And I was parked on having to change a flat tire in the dead of winter by myself a couple of weeks ago. It's been a wonderful machine. So in small mining, we can't go out and buy a brand new Komatsu or a brand new CAT or whatever. So we have to utilize uh, equipment like that. This is pond number two at the Cross Mine. And we're bringing the Caribou Hill water in here along with the Cross Mine water. After it's being limed here, it means the Caribou water, which has a natural pH of eight, almost no metal level. And then we form a film of lime in here that lasts for 24 hours and it discharges into the little creek. And that's for, uh, it takes seven days a week of maintenance of that system. You can see pond number one and how green that water is from liming. Some of the uh, caribou crew that was involved with the uh, 1950s uranium attempt, some very famous people, uh, people in that picture. Again, some of the drilling we've done at the Cross Mine that shows the new veins that we've uncovered early day caribou. This is what it looked like in the 1870s up on Caribou Hill. And 
And I'll never figure out when they take these pictures in all these old mining towns that the women and children are always have these beautiful dresses on. I don't know how they were able to do that in those days, but this is starting to sink a shaft on the Belcher Pine about 1876. Those boilers at the Caribou Mine use four quarts of firewood a day. And you can see the wood back there. That's some of the crew at the Caribou Mine. Again, land position. We've done an awful lot of work with SRK engineers. This is something that's fascinating is that here's the cross pine, the Caribou Mine. And that pink black line is the outline of the contact between the old Precambrian gneiss, which is 1.7 billion years old, and the monzonite, which is 62 million years old. This is a tertiary monzonite. This goes for two miles. This goes for four miles and all the way up to Jamestown and down to uh, Idaho Springs. But you see, whenever this thing makes a curve, we're finding a gold stock work in those curves. Now, when I was talking about those trike slip faults northeast southwest, the Anaconda, No Name, Caribou Park, Pomeroy Mountain, Rich asked me an interesting question the other day about those falls. And now we found that those veins that are in the Precambrian go right into the monster. So, what age are those faults and how they affected those veins and emplacement of ore? But we're also finding as you're mining down a vein, you'll have faulting, you'll have post-mineral faulting. It's not, it, you always see slick insides on the foot wall and hanging wall, but we're seeing them perpendicular to the hanging wall and foot wall, which is quite intriguing, uh, post-mineral faulting. School kids, we've had over 40,000 kids visit the mine. And in the old days, I used, one of my things was doing a dynamite explosion. And I used to do it for dance group. And I did that to teach kids about finding blasting caps or explosives on a construction site or a home building or a shopping center. And not to touch them, to record them. Because every year in America, about 10 kids lose their fingers or they go blind by picking up a blasting cap and hitting with a hammer. So I would educate the kids about the dangers of finding explosives. Well, in addition to that, I showed them how our explosives work. And the student who would answer the toughest question I asked, I got to light the fuse. And we would have a half a stick of powder and we'd blow something up, a computer, a old clock, or a boot, or whatever. And um, so I'm giving a lecture down at Women in Mining's Industry Appreciation Night in Denver one night. There's about 200 people in the crowd and I'm talking about this dynamite explosion where we used to take the lip which would take 10 minutes to go off, and we'd throw it over the hill, and one of them wrapped around our phone wire right in front of the mine. And we had 12 cars parked there. We had minutes to move those cars, get everybody in safe, and just <laughs> So who's sitting in the audience at Women in Mining? John Petty, who was head of District 8 M. Shaw. <laughs> and after my talk, he said, Tom, I, I need to have a talk with you. So we went into the men's restroom, and he looked me in the eye about this far away, and he said, Tom, if I ever hear of you doing a dynamite exhibition for school kids particularly, we're going to pull your licenses away. So I had to stop doing it. <laughs> Dan remembers those uh, very well. Uh, more kids. Again, I used to put them in the loader bucket and raise them up and down like a carnival ride. All these kids went into the mine. <coughs> From the aerial view, you can see this is where we're at. Uh, this is where the old town of Caribou existed for 40 years. There were 800 people living there. Uh, this is the cross mine, Caribou, I don't know, tunnel level that goes in 6,000 feet low, but this is Caribou Yell, the Comstock mine. Oak Hill, Idaho Hill. And one of the unique features of modern technology, and Rich is bringing in a, a new company, but uh, we did a Aerodat geophysical survey where they did uranium, thorium, magnetic flows, and magnetic highs. One thing we find is the magnetic flows often are where we're finding these big ore zones. They show 
up is deep blue on these. And again, this is all in the Vulcan program. Rich is working with some technology that has the ability to penetrate data that can be used to determine new veins um, and, and veins that can go down to significant depth. Uh, this fellow right here was instrumental in the early 1870s to develop the caribou mine. That T set was built from caribou silver. I spent 45 years trying to find out where that thing is. Uh, he sold the mine to a Dutch group and they moved people into Netherlands in 1873. Because Netherlands is a lowland, they named it Netherlands. It used to be called Brown's Place because of and what you would find in the Netherlands. And uh, the mine sold to a, a group for $3 million. It was the first silver mine in Colorado to sell for a multi-million dollar figure. Following that, Robert Dunn, who founded Dunn and Bradstreet, New York, took over the caribou mine and he had it for 25 years. And Chester A. Arthur was his attorney who helped fight some of the apex and land issues. And he uh, went on to become president of the United States. That's about all I brought today, but um, one, thing, uh, one thing that I've learned, well, a couple lessons I've learned. Make everything you do that's tough a challenge and you'll get over it, no matter how bad it is. Don't ever give up on it. If you're looking for partners in mining, do a lot of research. Today you have the internet, and you can go on the internet and find out millions of things about everybody you're dealing with. Um, the uh, MCHA, we have operated for the last 11 years without one citation. And that's whether we've got 10 people working or myself working. And the key to MSHA is not only your 40 hour training and eight hour refresher, but keep meticulous books. Mm -hmm. We have in our shelves in the mine office, 11 books surface inspection, equipment inspection, ventilation, air quality. Every time we go in the mine, we have to do our ribs, uh, back, floor samples, and write them in a log, paperwork, training. So when that MSHA inspector comes up and starts looking at plugs on extension cords and weighing your self-rescuers and saying, hey, who's this guy right here? Does he have his training? And he pulls out his pink sheet. Yes, he does. And he sees how we train, we spend an hour every Monday morning training, and we can do the 40-hour training at the mine. Usually we do the eight-hour refresher up at the Edgar mine. Uh, that's a critical thing. Air monitoring, we have a permit with the state of Colorado and Boulder County for air. Um, Division of Minerals Reclamation and Mining, that's our main reclamation permit. They're very fair people, they're pro-mining, but you don't want to get on the wrong side of those people. Any of these agencies, ATF, MSHA. Now, what about Boulder County? People say, Tom, you can't operate a mine in Boulder County. And I say, wait a minute. We went for an expansion permit in 1998. I'm sorry, in 2008. We worked with Walsh environmental scientists and engineers, and we did a massive amount of work. And we went to the Boulder County commissioners and applied for an expansion permit from two acres 9.6 acres and to build our new mine and mill. It was a public hearing. The Planning Commission had two public hearings. It was published in the Boulder Papers and we went to the meetings. I gave my presentation. There was not one person in that audience that opposed our mining expansion and they gave us approval. We went to the Boulder County Commissioners, three public hearings. Nobody stood up and opposed us. And part of that is educating working with our local community, <coughs> and working with the Boulder County government. Now some people say, well, when I go north to Fort Collins, I don't go through Boulder County. I don't want to contaminate myself with the weirdos that live up there. <laughs> but I can tell you, Boulder County is a pure mining community 80 years ago. It had 400 mills, hundreds of mines, it mining, ranching, and so forth. And yes, there's some weirdos. And yes, there's some funny things that go on in Boulder, but for the most part, if you do it right, they're gonna support you. We had one of the most liberal democratic commissioners who's still head of the county commissioner, Cindy Dominicio, I've known for 35 years, 
write a front page article in the Boulder camera that gold mining's uh, going to be rejuvenated and brought back at Caribou. Uh, and it's educating, it's talking to them, it's bringing them up to the line. But I can tell you, since we're at Caribou, and our water goes into Barclay Reservoir in Netherland, and that's now owned by the City of Boulder Water Department, we have one shot to do it right. No more. When we build our new mill, and we filter cake and, and uh, make a uh, Portland cement paste and put it underground, and we have recycling going on, we have one shot to make that work 24-7. If it screws up and goes down into Barker Reservoir and Boulder water system, that will be the fatal blow to us in every area. Uh, and so that involves line of sight, buildings, noise, water, uh, no spillage, spill prevention, the use of chemicals that we use. Um, one shot, I guarantee you. And I think we figured out a way to do it. It's gonna be more expensive. Now, how does a small miner do all this? Well, I've been lucky enough to start with nothing and find something. And when you find something and you put it together right, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And we've had offers from Cypress Copper Corporation when they were in existence, Placer Dome Mining. We had uh, Tecla Mining down and made us an offer. We had a merger in place with Canyon Resources, uh, Resource Capital Fund. We've had many major groups that have come in and tried to do a deal with us on Caribou. Many of them we've turned down. And then we've had some crooks and scoundrels, as Rich knows. We had a very prominent man here in Colorado that came in our back door and tried to steal everything from us. And we had to fight him in Denver Court and in Boulder. It was a $3 million lawsuit. And these idiots came to me and said, Tom, if you don't join our team, you're gonna be a street person in Boulder with a cardboard sign that said, I need money for food. And I looked these stupid fools in the face and I said, I would rather stand on the corner in Boulder with a cardboard sign with my miner helmet on and say that my life's career has been stolen by a bunch of low-life crooks here in Colorado than to work for you. We're just now, we settled that in 2014. We're settling some other matters, we're 99% there. And that's uh, gonna finally put us over the hill. So Rich has brought in some people that are wonderful, they're honest, they're a great group of people. And we believe that by this summer, we're gonna step by step be starting to build the new mine, the mill. We're gonna continue core drilling. We just finished last week a new NI4301 study by Hard Rock Consultants. Their offices are down here in Lakewood. And it's a wonderful 125 page uh, testimonial on everything from land to legal to resources to everything. And so stair step by stair step, I think we're there. Now, who are we gonna use to hire to work up there? <laughs> well, hopefully some of you, we, we hope. We've had a number of students, from even Melton Ward, who was chairman of the board of Cypress Copper, his son worked for me. Uh, Quentin Henning, who got his doctorate of ore deposits here at School of Mines, worked for me when he was 16 and got gold fever and came here to mines. And he worked for Homestake, Newmont, uh, many of the majors, he put his own public company together. And today he has Novo Resources, which has a beautiful gold, high grade gold deposit in uh, Northwest Australia. He lives in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, so we've had a lot of wonderful kids come out of, not kids, students, grown-ups from University of Colorado, from School of Mines, from other schools here in the state. And this is a district that's going to be around for a long, long time. I think Thomas will be at Old Ben when we're just starting to get to the top of the main ore body. So I don't know if I can convince my wife to let Thomas be a miner, but <laughs> I'm doing everything I can to educate him at a young age. So um, I brought a few rocks and minerals in. Uh, really, how do we go from ore to Doré, this is a Doré bar that we had made out of our concentrates at a facility in Colorado Springs. So we have found that we can take our concentrates and run them through